Hi everyone, today is a great day. Today we have an amazing venture capitalist with us who started her fund while homeless. She's one of the most celebrated and prominent black voices in and outside the venture capital industry. She has invested over $10 million in over 130 plus startups led by underestimated founders. Her first book on her personal journey into entrepreneurship and venture capital is out now, and it's called It's About Damn Time. So welcome to SheVC. I'm your founder and host, Gayatri Sarkar. So today's that day, we have Arlen Hamilton with us. She's the founder and managing partner of Backstage Capital. Welcome, Arlen. Welcome to SheVC. Hey, thanks for having me. I am super stoked to have someone like you. Give a big shout out to Brian for making this interview happen. Brian is the one who is a big catalyst for making Arlen come to SheVC. Yes, Brian Landers. Uh, yes. He's, he's a catalyst for a lot of things in my life, so I appreciate that. He's so amazing. So how's your back? How are you doing? My back is okay in this moment. Um, it's been a few, it's now been a couple of weeks now where it's been really bad and that's troubling because it happen, usually happens every few months and, and goes away after a few days. And so it's just getting worse and worse. But uh, I'm doing the, the exercises that they say to do and the stretches and taking some medicine. And hope, hopefully it'll be something I can have made. I know a lot of people probably have suffer back pain. They know what I'm talking yeah. about. You know? yeah. uh, so hopefully it's something I can just make more manageable. That's great. Um, I mean, I hope yoga also helps. Um, so your new book, it's about damn time. And I can see that that's the title of your book. And I was reading your book and I just want to ask you something that you founded backstage capital way back in 2015 to invest in underestimated founders. Do you think it would have been different if you have founded the fund in today's environment when black lives matter movement is holding the investors accountable? Oh, of course. Yeah, it would be different. Um, but I don't know if it would be taken as, as seriously. Uh, because not, not to say that any, anything that's built today shouldn't be taken seriously, it should, there should be room for everything and for people to change and to grow and to evolve. Uh, but we were saying it before it was something that before it was a hashtag, and we were saying it before it was uh, on, on the, the tips of everybody's tongue, it was, this is our lives. Okay. You know, and uh, we found the value in investing in black people for years and years and years ago, even before 2015. I really kicked it off 2011, this journey. So I think it would have been probably easier to raise. Um, but at the same time, you have all of this, uh, uh, these relationships and this, this uh, traction that you can point to because of that grind for the last five years. Very true. So when you talk about underestimated founders, what do you mean by that? Are you defining them by their access to capital and venture resources instead of race, color, or gender? For us, the fund started with we're going to invest in, in mostly tech startups that are led by women, people of color, and or LGBTQ founders. I started there really simply because I identify as all three. And the those groups I had been talking to had by and large been overlooked by other VCs and other investors and uh, didn't really have the access to the friends and family uh, rounds that so many people yeah. seem to have. This wasn't a hundred percent true. I mean, this was, you know, we're not a monolith, but it was, uh, it was true. So I just look at it as someone who was uh, in those groups who has felt underrepresented. We, we, we've, also along the way been asked, you know, why don't you focus on veterans or disabled or this and that? It's not that we don't um, look for all types of companies, but those are, we, we are very firm in our understanding of the needs of founders of this mandate and this thesis. And so we want to, just like any good VC worth their salt, we want to be um, really uh, well prepared and, and, and well founded, I guess, is the, is the way to say it uh, for, for our thesis. And so that's where we are. 
That's great. And you already have invested all this over 130 plus startups by these underestimated founders. Uh, many people think it is a pipeline problem to find diverse founders. What way do you think the industry can tackle that pipeline problem? Or is there a pipeline problem? Existing? There's no pipeline problem. <laughs> We've seen nearly 7,000 companies, 7,000 companies, 99% of them with underrepresented founders across the country, some in other countries other than the U.S. In the last five or six years alone, mm -hmm. we invest in about 2% of what we see. So I, I have no idea. Maybe they're looking at the wrong pipe. I don't know, or maybe they're smoking it. I don't, I really don't know how we can call this a pipeline problem any longer. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe five years ago, three years ago, maybe we could have said that that was an excuse. It wasn't then, but maybe we can get away with it. No, today there's no pipeline problem. There are uh, incredible companies led by, by brilliant founders. Some of them will not do well. Some of them are, will, will prove us wrong and that they're not, you know, they're not going to be able to be sustainable. But many, many, many of these companies, both the ones we've invested in and the ones that we see, will go on to do great things and have already done great things. Absolutely. That's the parlor distributed return of venture capital. Um, so in your book, chapter 21, you talk about this industry wasn't built for us. And by industry, you mean venture capital. So fundraising is always a systematic a very long journey for everyone, you know, whether you're white, you're black, but especially difficult if you're a woman or a person of color or anyone with no track record. If I give you a magic wand, what changes you want to bring institutionally in venture capital as an asset class in terms of fundraising from LP? From Fundraising from LPs or fundraising yeah. from f other funds? Oh, from Fund LPs. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> because that's think, the way the problem starts, you know? Well, uh, well actually, it, it's to me, I look at that as that's where the solution starts. And right. I'm sure you feel the same, right? That, to me, when I look across the table at other funds, I just always think about who are investing in these, these who are enabling these uh, myopic thinkers so to well do said. so well, to, to have so much under management when there is just so much creativity. Because I know that institutional investors have to be very conservative and they have to have a very, you know, have a strategy. And I understand that. Um, but there are some LPs who gained their own wealth by being risk takers and by being first mm -hmm. to market and by being, um, you know, visionaries. And th those same people are handing their money over, their riches, their hard-earned or hard-inherited money over to some very, very risk-averse, bland fund managers. Not all. I've met some incredible fund managers that are very exciting. I personally have invested as an LP now into 10 different funds. I've been quietly doing that over the last two years. Wow. Of course, not a ton of money, but... We're talking fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollar commitments a piece, and that um, matters. Which, yeah, and it matters. It matters, and it's it's part of a, a a greater plan that I have. So if I could wave a magic wand, it would be for this sort of lulling and this sort of uh, autopilot for LPs to be taken off. This is your money, and I understand that part of your business model is to hand it off to other people to invest. Uh, but I would say get back in the game a little bit. Pay attention because if you pay attention, you're going to find you're probably, you probably have a better nose than the middle person that you're they're putting this into. And so that, true. if it were my wealth, which it will be one day, that's exactly what I would do. So true. Um, you have amazing LPs from Mark Cuban, to some of the top VCs. How did you reach out to them? And you know, you don't come from that area of privilege. How did you access them? And how did you... Um, make them believe in your dreams or in yeah. your mission? Well, early on, the, the LPs were, you know, it was zero. It was like walking in a desert, begging for a drip of water. And then over time, through me staying consistent in my messaging, getting better and better at how I presented that. And um, the problem, I think, overall becoming more and more uh, evident 
that there were these companies that were being overlooked and why am I missing out on this as the LP, right? The, early on, there were people like Ellen Powell, Mark Andreessen, Chris Saka, uh, uh, Stuart Butterfield, Aaron Levy, all of these investors who are in our early funds as angels. I, I call them angel LPs because these were smaller, smaller amounts. Mark Cuban, in particular, is a really interesting case because Mark does not like to put his money into other people's funds. He does yeah. on occasion, but he likes, he loves the game, the hunt. So he doesn't, I've had a conversation with him before he invested where he said, why would I, why would I invest in another person's fund? I, I like the hunt. He changed his tune though, when he saw that I was having trouble raising from traditional LPs. Because he said, well, that, and this was before anything became, you know, became popular to do. Mm. So that doesn't make sense. You know, he, I think he recognizes, it's like game recognizing game. Mm. I think he understands that I am not going anywhere. And I have so much to prove to myself. F forget about others. I have so much to prove to myself. So true. And so much riding on my reputation that there's no other option but to win. And so not only did he come in, but Cuban is half of the assets under management that we have. And he honestly doesn't do that very often. And, yeah. and we'll have a conversation. And, and anyway, so I, we, we were introduced at South by um, because we spoke together on stage at, at Twitter house and we had a great exchange. He met my family and he was very cordial. And then a few months went by and, and we started talking business and, it's been about a year, year and a half, and we, we talk every week, if not every day. That's amazing. You, you talk about something that's so interesting, that the feedback, that you're learning constantly when you're raising money, and game understands game. Let's talk about the game for the startups, the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the backstage of studio that you are building. Let's talk a little bit about it and how you are taking those companies, how you're looking at those founders. So we have Backstage cap Capital, which manages these micro funds, if you will, these mm. nano funds. I mean, they're tiny. Um, and we built that. I built that 25K, 100K at a time. And then we invest 25 to 100K. We historically had invested that to just really build the case study and really build up the traction mm. to see what decisions we would make as a firm. Um, but you know, the management, there's no, there's no real management dollars to speak of, management fees to speak of is something like that. So around the end of 2017, top of 2018, Christy Pitts, who's my uh, business partner and I, we got together and said, well, actually it was, I said, let's start a studio. And she said, okay, let's see how we make that reality. <laughs> you know, that's usually me heads in the cloud. And then Christy will bring me right a little bit lower and, and, and let, let us know what's real. Um, and we started this studio, we co-founded the studio where we work with, with corporations and other funds and other organizations to help them um, do what we do with the fund and give them insights to our portfolio. And so that just basically keeps the lights on. It's a great way to partner with incredible uh, Fortune 500 companies to just let us do what we do best. And it also benefits the founders. Now, you know, at first, when we first did this, the first year of it, I guess because it was getting press and people don't tend to like the press, um, we were getting, well, why, you're, you're, you're spreading your, you know, you're, you're splitting your time and you're doing this. They have to understand the strategy involved, mm. the pure strategy. When you have no resources like we have, like to the bone, month to month, you get super creative. And instead of this being split uh, and divisive, of attention, it is actually focus has us focusing the aperture more than I think anyone else could in our position. And I'm very proud of what we were able to accomplish. First thing out the gate at Backstage Studio was a four city, two country accelerator. Wow. That was, that was so competitive. We received 1900 applications in five weeks for wow. 24 spots where we invested 100,000 in exchange for 5%. So definitely not a pipeline problem. There's no pipeline problem. <laughs> <laughs> so the, we, we make, we make uh, a way for ourselves where there is not. That is just the only way we know how to do this. And uh, I think finally, finally people are starting to understand it. 
like only in the last few weeks, I think people are starting to understand <laughs> this. And I hope this does not remain as a status quo. You know, there have been recently some articles that, oh, my emails are inundated with, you know, so many responses. And now when I am also asking, like, what's the next step? Nothing is happening. And yeah. this, this is, I want to ask you is that, do you find LPs are more responsive to you now and your portfolios, not only just to you, also to your portfolios after the Black Lives Matter movement? And did investors and LPs reach out to you to understand how they can bring the change? Because you are the yes. most prominent voice in this industry. Well, um, absolutely got a lot of inbound to say the least. I mean, um, just incredible amount of inbound, had to figure out how to suss the noise and had to figure out you know, how to leverage because I have work to do. Uh, my job isn't to, to make everybody feel great about themselves because they reached out to me and got a picture, you know, got a, got a like on Twitter from me. You know, that's not my job. Yeah. My job is to work with these founders and to return capital to my investors and um, to be a good person while you're doing it, to be kind. So a lot of inbound, a lot of it was sincere. A lot of it was, hey, so we haven't been paying enough attention we get it. Do you want to have that conversation that you wanted to have two years ago? Because we're now we're, we have the ability to have it, to have it. So I have to look at that individually and say, who do I want to work with? Mm -hmm. Who do I want to expose to our founders? Is it someone that I feel is genuine yeah. and that we could be additive to each other? Or is it someone who is simply ticking a box that they don't look bad? I don't have time for that. Uh, and thankfully there are enough on the positive side that it is making traction and the people who were already down. So the people who already made those investments, the people who are already going to our investor days, the people who are already asking us, can I see what you're working on th this year? People were already doing that. Of course, they're first in line. Of course, they're the first people who get, um, a look at what we are doing because you have to understand I was someone who was living out of an airport five years ago. Uh, had run out of food stamps, didn't know where my next meal was coming from. And wow. I was still telling everybody, I'm going to invest in 100 companies by 2020. And then I reached that in 2018. So if, if that's how I that's was thinking amazing. five years ago, thank you. If that's how I was thinking five years ago, can you imagine what I have in mind right now? Mm. And it's the people who are savvy, who are on the cusp of things who are saying, let's tap into what is backstage is thinking on for the next five to 10 years. Not, you know, looking at, well, they don't have a, a senior partner and the partner hasn't been around for 15 years in venture. Venture is not working by and large. 85% or so of all venture doesn't return more than 1.2x. So how is, why is that something for me to look at and to say, well, I want to be like that. It's the fact that we're different that is going to shake things up. I can't tell you how many times I've said something on camera or on audio that has happened two years later that I've predicted. It just happens. So I'm not, I'm not gonna get it all right. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm human. There are so many other people working on this. So many other people who just don't get the headlines, don't get the covers, right? But the fact is, internally as, as an LP, you really have to start thinking about what venture is going to look like in five years, rather than what it looks like and has looked like. That is your downfall in this asset class. So true. I mean, that's why I started GVC, that I wanted to amplify more women GPs and diverse GPs in this industry because we see the same fund managers in all the podcasts talking about the same thing. And I think it's so important because diversity matters a lot. Um, I want to ask a question that is um, from an amazing Black emerging fund manager. Her name is Sheila. She's coming to SheVC along with Brad Feld. She's the founder of Zane Capital and wanted to know your thoughts on emerging fund managers during COVID-19. And do you think accessing capital has got harder during this time for emerging fund managers? During COVID. So it's so nuanced, right? Because you have COVID, but then you say, well, then there's Black Lives Matter really being true right now. People are actually paying attention. Um, I don't, I haven't personally seen, and I've been, you know, not only as a GP, but as looking as an LP and um, helping people connect to money, because it's not all for us. I've definitely been like passing it around, right? I haven't seen where LPs have been incredibly scared. I think, I think there's 
there's some understanding that there's some deep roots with a lot of LPs. And because they have been um, at least steadfast in the allocation mm. so far the last few years, uh, we can argue about their thesis, but the allocation and the, the cadence of that, there's pe- there are people who have runway and they're not going to, you know, just close up shop because they are, they're thinking, wait a second, this is 2009, this is 2008. Do I get in where I fit in? <laughs> you know, uh, so I think that I think that it's not necessarily going to be more difficult to raise capital as an emerging fund manager because of COVID. I think there is the capital there. I just think that you're going to see fewer bets made at higher amounts because people are going to be, there's no, there's no real spray and pray. It's going to be like getting really intentional and getting really uh, focused and again, waking up a little bit. It's been on autopilot for quite a while. And I think people are like, no, I, w- I want to see this at a different level before, before a decision is made. I'm not just going to trust someone else to make a decision. So that's where someone who's differentiated, someone who's interesting, someone who's seeing things that other people aren't seeing, someone who's not in these four pockets of the country that get 80 whatever percent of the French, that's where people get really interesting especially if you've been doing it for a while. Mm. If you pop up and you say, oh, I think this is where things are going to go. Like, for instance, I know a lot of white men who will pop up and have an impact fund. Anytime you hear any policy change, oh, I'm raising 100 here and 50 here, and then it really doesn't do anything. So pop-ups, not necessarily, but if you've been doing your thing for a while and people have just been overlooking and missing you, I think this is your time to shine. So well said, because the reason she asked that, there were obviously a lot of diversity mandates in the institutional side. And the moment COVID-19 hit, a lot of people started canceling those. And now after Black Lives Matter movement, suddenly things are changing. So Mm -hmm. hopefully, as I said, it's not a status quo and it will, the changes for a longer duration. That's why I say you stay, I don't, I don't fluctuate with, with the tides. I don't go, oh, they're doing this now. I better go on that side. Or they're in this, this lane's moving faster. I better switch lanes. I stay right where I am. Stay right where I am. I do the best that I can in that lane. And eventually it becomes your lane. It gets back to your lane. It catches you. So true. I would love to know a little bit about the backstage crowd that you're talking about. Give us a little bit insight about that. Yes. Yeah, so we, talking about, you know, hacking and making our way, we, um, started a syndicate which we didn't invent of course there's spvs all over the place but before as i said we were making investments of twenty five thousand fifty thousand a hundred thousand and and up until last year a hundred thousand was the most we could invest in the company and that was a big deal for us we decided to start an uh uh, a syndicate on our own platforms so, so you know not on anyone else's platform and what we do is two lanes. So at back, you go to backstagecrowd.com. You want to invest alongside us as, a, as an angel, as a fund. We have funds on there as well. Uh, and you want to get in on, on our deals. You can do one of two tracks. One track is a non-accredited track where we simply push you to other deals that are in our portfolio. But it might be on a Republic or a, a WeFund or a Seed Invest. And we, uh, someone on our, on our very first one that we did just made history uh, last week by becoming the first black man to raise 1,070,000 under that little bit to do with that towards the end. Um, and so that's a lot of fun. We have 1,500 people signed up. On the second track or the other track is the accredited investor. And I know everyone watching this most likely understands what that is. Uh, and those are private deals. We were able to, we've launched our first one as of now. We were able to raise 300,000 in nine days. The deal's not even done yet. We have an allocation up to a million because the founder was so um, impressed with us that they said, take it from 400,000 allocation to a million. This is a company we invested in three years ago that has already multiplied for us on our small 25K investment. it will be worth approximately $300 million next year when they have their next raise. And their next raise is, is committed by their current investors for the most part. So this is just simply a 
um, you can call it a bridge, but they don't need it. It's just a, a little bit of extra allocation for some, some of us and uh, really cool negotiated terms. So now we're able to, for better or for worse, you know, anything can go to zero, but we're able to get into these deals because we've had so much reputation and time with these companies that are doing well. They say, come back in. You have an allocation of your choosing. We do it on terms that are favorable. And if you can raise 500K, 250, a million, you can come in with that much. And then we take a carry, no management fee. So I think it's going, to, I think that is really going to change things for us. Because if we're able to make, there are so many times where we were, we were missing out on our pro rata. I mean, left and right, we didn't have follow on capital. We barely had the initial check. Now we have you know, we can put together 250K with the with incredible crowd. Um, we can put together 250K in a week. We can put together a million over a month or two, I think. So um, that's backstagecrowd.com. We certainly want a very diverse group of people making investments. We're not um, here to make, you know, the same old, same old rich. That's just, again, it's not exciting to me. So, um, you know, I'm a partner at a sports fund and we have the largest sports um, startup accelerator in the world. And mm -hmm. um, I watch uh, Real Sports with Brian Gamble so much and he's one of my favorite sports journalists. And recently mm -hmm. he talked about black tax at uh, HBO Sports. So I would like to ask you, have you personally paid black tax? So here's what I want to know from you. I want you to describe what you mean by that. That's an interesting say to it because as a person, I don't know what is black taxes. And um, I think mm. under unless you are a person of color. So mm. my background is that when I go outside driving, the police treat me differently. So I look at the world through my eyes, but that mm. is not the world is. And I think that's what is happening with the people of color. And that is what is happening with mm -hmm. the black tax. So that's why I would like to know that what things yeah. that you have to do because you are a person of color and well, being black? I, it happens in a couple of ways. One way is in very, in the, what they call microaggressions. These, I call them paper cuts. When you get a paper cut, you don't run around the room and tell her, I got a paper cut, you know, like you would if your arm, you know, was off. <laughs> but it hurts, doesn't it? Mm. Paper cuts hurt like hell. And so these microaggressions of someone mistaking you for the help, when you're supposed to be the keynote speaker happens to me all the time when someone <laughs> thinks that the black man who walked in with the white woman can possibly be the ceo although he is this and that those those um things add up and they're paper cuts and every one of them hurts and i think that we have to kind of go through that in silence a lot of the time and then when we sort of explode with our with our frustration when it when it's just the last straw we're considered angry or we're considered violent or we considered this and that and, and you know it, it is really a an insult to an injury and then we have to watch our fellow humans get killed on television almost on a monthly basis in a country that we pay literal tax to i pay the same tax and i have uh 40 of my wealth go gone but you don't get treated the same. The other part of it is, is a little bit more obvious and can be pointed to is, which is, but it's still behind the scenes, which is the goalpost being moved. So for instance, I'll give you a quick example. This happened earlier on in my race, maybe 2015, 16. I had someone who said that they were, it was a white man who was an LP and had some influence on top of that with other LPs. And they said, well, of course, we, you're very early. <laughs> you just got started. We like what you're doing, though. So we need you to have 20, 20 or so investments under your belt. And then you can come back and we'll anchor. You know, obviously, if, we, if you like what we see, the number was the point. So I went out and I had 20 investments maybe in a year and a half because we were moving at a fast clip. Um, and I came back and I was so excited and I presented. And they were like, you could tell that they just didn't think we were going to be able to do that. And they said, come back when you have 50. So I literally came back when I had 50 investments, which is ridiculous. Because, I mean, there's some funds will never have 50 and shouldn't have 50, you know, depending yeah. on your, your method. Came back with 50. Mm, 
didn't think I was going to get there. Come back when you have X, 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 and keep moving the goalpost. When I, in earnest, felt that the first time was a sincere, you're going to take me seriously. But it was really, and so that has happened a lot when it comes to LPs, making certain commitments verbally, you know, flying people out and having this and these conversations and tracking and this and that. And then when it comes down to it, 11th hour, pull back for some reason. And at the same time, you have to understand that would be fine in a bubble. Yeah, I might yeah. even believe that it was real and that it was legitimate. But at the same time, I'm sitting next to white men who are my age or younger, so late 30s or younger, who have less experience than I do, but went to the right school or have the right word, Deloitte or, or Stanford or whatever the word is, McKinsey, in their, on paper. And they're working on their second fund, $40 million up from the 15 million that they raised before. And I'm over here saying, I'm trying to figure out how to get $25,000 into a company that will go on, this is true, will go on to be worth $80 million three years later and will be worth four times that a year from now. And we saw them before they even raised a million. And I'm looking for scraps to make sure I can pay payroll while I'm being told that the that what I being gaslighted actually, and being told that what we said to you before is is not true. You 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 misheard us. So all of that insult to injury. What that leads me to say is maybe I don't necessarily want to share my winnings with with the society like this that would would do this to me. Maybe I'll figure out the same way I've hacked my way in. I'll figure out a way to hack my way around. And that's when you're going to be looking at me seven years from now and saying, why on earth are we not in X Acme 14 that's sitting on the moon right now and, and is, has 600 X? Why are we not in that company? That's the decisions you can make today. I'm not saying that, um, you know, I had this one shot and I may make it. I'm not, not, I'm saying, look at all of us. Yeah. If we have, if we are, if you are talking to a black woman in venture who has made her way this far to be in front of you, you have to imagine what she has gone through to get there. Absolutely. Thank you very much. On that high note, I would like to thank you for coming on CVC and giving your insights. I think there's so many emerging fund managers, not only black, person of color, but everybody, they're looking up to you. You're like a man of many of us, you know? So I'm thank super you. excited and thank you, Arlen, for giving your time. I appreciate it. Thank you.